You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. <laughs> Hello? Is that the famous astronomer, Sir Patrick Moore? It is, very much so. Any news on the space front? No, quite so, quite so. Elon Musk has just designed and developed five gigantic state-of-the-art rocket ships. All members of Parliament, along with the American Senate, have first-class tickets aboard them, you see. They're told they're going to the moon. Told? Where exactly are they going, Sir Patrick? The new anomaly discovered recently, astronomically. A huge black hole. Welcome to Twin Souls. Twin Souls is brought to you in association with the Paranormal UK Radio Network, your hosts, Philip and Ronald Kinsella. And we want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now, we wanted to do something slightly different with uh, this month's show and just give you a catch up of what's been going on and what we've both been doing behind the scenes. And um, and it's nice to be here. Hello, Ronald. How are you? Hello. You? I'm fine, thank you. Yes. Had a lovely Christmas, didn't we? Yes, it was superb. And now we're looking forward to 2022 and wondering um, what that's going to bring, um, certainly with the UFO stroke UAP um, you know, Department of Investigations. And what's interesting, and, and I, it does make me laugh, that, you know, that the acronym of uh, the UFO, Unidentified Flying Object, has now been changed to Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And that's always puzzled me. But I, I get the feeling that that's been done because it's more scientific and takes emphasis um, away from, uh, you know, the fact that uh, they could be vehicles from another star system or another galaxy or dimension. Yeah, they're, what they're doing is, is uh, I, well, I can't believe it, but they're actually trying to remove the stigma. But then are they doing that? to try and eventually state that these things are explainable. Yeah, and we also had the report that came out, um, you know, with the, the um, UFO UAP report, and everyone was very, you know, a little bit thwarted at the fact that not much information was given out, and we were supposed to be promised some more information. But what's really amazing is that a lot of researchers that, you know, the world over are still battling for this disclosure and um, and I think that's really good so any of you folks out there who are really looking into the phenomena or you know doing your own uh, field investigations whether it be just research or actually going out to these places or sky watching you're all contributing a very important element to the field of investigations. Yeah, what we want to do as well, I want to talk about our books published by Philip Mental. Um, he released our books uh, uh, early this year um, mine, the digital demon countdown to disaster. Yeah, mine is uh, you, the public deceived, the grand UFO deception. Yeah, and what we're going to do, I'm going to tell you a bit about that and read you an extract from the actual book. Um, it, it, my one, the digital demon, the title does refer to actually the mobile phones, the digital era. So, and it, it's a, it has a double barreled meaning because it does slip into the demonic aspect. The book looks at every angle of the aliens. It's not tunnel visioned. We, we, we don't know what they are. And let's be honest, we don't know what we're dealing with. And the, no matter how much research you apply, no matter how deep you go into that rabbit hole, it's like you're left with nothing. And this is the way it works. It's like uh, trying to catch shadows. You can't do it. So my book, The Digital Demon, it goes into mine and Philip's childhood. And my God, what a childhood that was. Um, it, it starts 
from when I was old enough to remember school and this I will recount because uh, I love doing voices of people. Philip and I have always done uh, uh, voices of mimicking characters who were interesting and um, there was uh, one incident when I was at junior school and one particular teacher um, I've given her a pseudo name because I don't want to be sued um, when this was published. Her name, I'll call her Miss Butcher and this hasn't been coloured or elaborated on. I've given the truth. Um, I mean, a lot of us do have a hard time at school because you're new there and you have a lot of adversary from other pupils. The way you look, the way you dress um, is all recorded by them and used as a weapon sometimes if they don't like you. Um, but this teacher, she clearly had it in for me because this is one... <laughs> this is one of the incidents that occurred and do you know it's funny going back in this book when you go back in time it can be very emotional um, when we're referring to the people we've lost but also very intriguing when you recount the stories of, of being at school and so Miss Butcher was this formidable northern lady i would say she was about 56 years old i'll try and describe her as i have in the book um she's quite tall she's very butch um cropped grayish hair do you know she reminded me of a combination of enid sharples from coronation street when she was in her 50s and also that character i know it sounds wicked but she does look a little bit like that character the cartoon from cinderella the original cartoon by disney the wicked stepmother so she she has that although she was northern like this you know because i said i love doing voices it's not to demean anyone it's just something philip and i always did because we took people off but we used to do our own plays as well at home i mean we wanted to be actors originally but <laughs> that never panned out so I'm going to read you an extract from my book. And this was one incident of many that occurred, I believe. Is it Robbie Williams had the teacher who was rotten to him, the singer? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I remember he wrote, reading He wrote that. a song about that. Yes, I think it was Karma Killer, wasn't Karma it? Killer, I think that was. OK, here we go. So I'm going to read an extract from The Digital Demon. You can purchase it. It's available as ebook, paperback, hardback, and audio as well. I don't narrate the audio. That's done by a gentleman who's marvellous. Um, but right here we go right so this spelling test was my nemesis we were given a list of 20 words to memorize each week and the following week we had an exam and had to spell them correctly yes you've already found it I never bothered with the homework and if I did I carelessly whisked through it the night before now before I carry on I will explain that I admit that I did do my homework I admit I was confused and quite bone idle but I did try and give it my all I just you're a kid of nine years old you know you have this formidable teacher so here we go because I only got one or two words correct each week my decision to cheat was like most things for me a last minute decision it was an extremely bold but reckless attempt on my part to prove I could attain above average results. Thinking about it now, it was pretty damn stupid, having a terrible track record to then suddenly gain a measure of success. I had been told that if there wasn't significant improvement by this particular lesson, consequences would arise. Miss Butcher was seated at her desk, coffee mug on standby for another refill, when she called out the words one by one, with us writing them down using the correct spelling. Upon finishing, I was surprised because she didn't ask us to hand the papers in. Rather, we were to exchange them with our fellow pupils, with them acting as checkers. Since I had no one sitting beside me, I held on to mine as she began to recite every spelling, with us marking the paper with either a tick or cross. Mine were virtually all wrong. I think I got one, but that was it. I ticked 16, hoping this number would sound acceptable, albeit possibly raising an eyebrow. I was in a desperate situation, you see. Miss Butcher then asked for them to be swapped back and for us to announce our marks. Ronald, how many did you get? She asked. I hesitated before responding. Sixteen, miss. She gave me a quizzical look over her glasses and briskly observed the class. That's very good. Who marked your paper? Now I felt extremely stupid and was shaken terribly. I did. She just stared at me for a moment, her expression rather blank. Bring it here. I picked up the paper, went over to her desk, and she carefully scrutinised it. 
It didn't take her long to realise my skullduggery. She finally raised her head and said, Class, we have a cheat. She finally turned to face me. You will stand nose pressed against the blackboard until the end of this session. I obediently complied and pressed my nose against it, waiting for a possible slap across the back side. However, I was surprised I didn't receive any physical punishment. I wished I had. After the session, she ordered me to her desk and shook her head. You will miss games this Friday and write out every single word 200 times. I've written a note to your father and I want to see better results the next time we have a spelling test. Is that understood? Yes, Miss Butcher. Sorry, Miss Butcher. I dutifully handed the note to my father, knowing that concealment would be very unwise, and I rightly got a good hiding. I was then instructed by him to concentrate on my homework, and for me, the dining room in Haysbury Crescent became a room of torture. I was forced to work there until I had completed all tasks. That is just one of the stories in the book um, that I recited um, based on the past. Um, the chapter headings for the book are as follows. The Fabricated Lie, 1979. The Dreaded Teacher, Wendy House's Teddy Bears and Choppers. The Electronic Eye, 1982. We Are Not Going to Harm You. Curiosity Didn't Kill the Cat. The Curious Admission of a Grandfather. We Come in Peace. Fairies Down the Garden, Hobgoblins in the House. Land of Hope and Glory. The Reptilians. A Ouija Board Deceptions and the Occult, The World of Slumber and Shadows, Into the Snake Pit, Signatures, In the Lap of the Sorcerer, Planting the Seed, Lucifer's Angels, Signature of the Master, The Quantum Curator, A Future Most Foul, and finally, The Vision. And you know, I loved writing this book. It was a challenge, but you know, I think what I did was I went through it again and again. I think when you're a writer, the best thing to do is to uh, knock it out. <laughs> it sounds a bit blunt, doesn't it? But knock it out. And then you go back to it again and again where you can polish it, revise it, you know, just uh, edit it. And it, it, it was as it was taking shape, I thought this is wonderful because it doesn't just go into the dreaded teacher. Philip and I, as I said, used to do plays. And of course, that makes you imaginative. And that, uh, with this subject of UFOs, comes with a curse. Yes, and I remembered going back to school. Um, you know, I, I really believed I had superhuman powers, and there was this one kid who always picked on me. And I remembered one break time, I literally lifted him up and threw him into a rose bush, this great big huge <laughs> rose bush, and he disappeared. And I was sent up to the headmaster's uh, office, and at that time, I, both Ronnie and I were prefects, and he said... He said to me, now, I've heard rumours that you picked someone up and threw them into a rose bush. Is that true? And I did lie and I said, no, sir, I, I would never do that. And you know, I, I knew that you would be, would, would be honest with me. And I dreaded that moment. But, we, you know, looking back, we did have a teacher there called Mr. Charles and a, uh, a pipe smoking gentleman. And our, our tutor was a, a lovely lady, an Australian lady called Miss Horton. And she was a wonderful lady, and, and she introduced us to Mr. Charles one summer holiday, and that's when we got involved in UFOs, because he lent us his entire collection of uh, paranormal magazines that we used to take back to our grandparents' house, and, you know, we were told to look after them, which we do with everything. So, and this, this is all stems back to our childhood, with also the viewing of the sphere, or the eye, as Ronnie calls the it. The electronic eye, yes, 1982, yes. Yeah, with our grandmother and the back of her garden they used to live in Feltham in Middlesex in a, a very big house and that was observed um, very clearly in broad daylight just me running our grandmother and ever since then you know we've had these experiences with UFOs and I have to say at very close range but the last ones that were observed was and on the 9th of April 2016 at 11 15 p.m. at night now they were the last ones that we had seen at close range and we haven't seen anything since that time yeah the, you know there's one thing that is amazing about this phenomena I mean let's discount all the the drones 
uh, atmospheric distortions that people will throw at you or um, a super secret aircraft by the military, which is absolutely nonsense. I think we know they're smart enough not to fly super secret aircraft uh, over civilian airspace, especially in a, a town. But when those UFOs arrived, the three of them, when they appeared and they stopped above our heads, they're about 90 feet up. That's all they were, uh, very low. There was no darkness I could discern uh, encompassing them. They, they looked independent, three shimmering balls of light. And they did some strange maneuvers above us. They were completely silent. Now, one thing that's very interesting about our road is it's always busy. You will have people walking down there. You will have cars coming all the time. When these things arrived, there was nothing. It was dead. You know, like a ghost town? It was like that. I remembered looking around, it's all dark. No one, you'd, you'd expect someone to pick out a window or you know, a light flashing on and off. It's as if time had been frozen, not mechanically, but mm. subtly frozen. Mm. Somehow these things had evidently frozen time. Another interesting thing, and I don't know if this is part of the, the, the fashion they use to try and uh, remain invisible to others, although they'll be it, they're there, is the fact that when we spoke, Philip and I spoke while these things were above us, our voices were muffled. You know, like it, when it snows heavily, um, that's what it was like. It sounded like that. So had they put some kind of bubble mm. over us, uh, their reality? Yeah, well, I always have said there's two parts to the UFO phenomena. When the uh, parents of UFO is, uh, you know, observed, uh, it's able to distort time and perhaps space even. And then in some instances, the phenomena seems to work on a deeper level of the human psyche where it integrates on a very personal level. You know, I think, to be honest with you, we have to look into what we as a human species are. I mean, we're looking out there to try and work out what this phenomena is, and that's very important. But I think that this subject matter will open up a can of worms of where we as human beings are concerned in terms of creation. And, um, you know, I've always stipulated that there's two parts to us as humans. There is the spiritual part and there's also the physical part. People call it the soul or consciousness. And I've always believed that there is much more to life than mere existence, just being born, building memories and then dying. And that's it. Consciousness extinguished forever. There is more to this. And I think that through our investigations and our research we're beginning to realize that ufo phenomena does come with levels of high strangeness that many researchers the world over are trying to piece together and i think that's very important um, not just looking into the one box of ufos coming from another planet um you know i think it could be interdimensional or at least that's where i i mean i've always been open to all forms of speculation whether they be time travelers, whether they be from another dimension or alternative dimensions of reality, ultra terrestrials, a physical planet. Now, that's interesting. You mentioned time travelers. Now, I don't have a problem with that. It's just what method will they use? Uh, it's funny, you know, this is really weird because I've had some insights into the future. Uh, I, people say it's a psychic ability. Well, I think we all have that. But it was proved categorically by another uh, gentleman. Um, it's in my book, um, What Happened. But I had a vision of the future, and it was accurate. So there is some kind of time uh, reality. It's just that time itself, when we think about time, it doesn't really exist. I know it sounds ridiculous to say that because we've been conditioned by the clock when we're born. It's, it's, we've been dogmatized <laughs> to a degree by the clock. But when you think about it, time is only a mere measurement. It's, it's not corporeal. It's not real. It's not solid. You know, so what exactly would the machine be composed of or comprised of? And what would we throw it into to alter time as we call it it's not real time so it's a real big paradox you know you are not discounting it i think there's there's some possibility to it yes you're absolutely right because every single person if i can use the time hypothesis is leading their own lives and recording their experiences through life so you're right which timeline is that object going to go into because all our lives are different you know we all, all tend to think that we're all doing the same things and having the same memories when i think this may lead us into the understanding on a deeper level of the abduction phenomena because i've always stated that wherever they come from 
Um, they're interested in our memories. They're interested in what makes us tick as human beings. And, uh, you know, these these guys, as they call the greys, don't seem to have any personality, no reproductive uh, conditioning, nothing at all. So I think that, you know, this is exciting because it gives us hope in the sense that we know there's a lot more out there, but operating on different levels of reality. So that's why I've always maintained the hypothesis that we could be now really looking into interdimensional levels of reality. Um, you know, we go into space time, and I've got to use the time in our universe, which we measure time by through the motions uh, of the planets and the bodies. But I think that these beings obviously come from a a world, a realm, whatever you want to call it, that's so far removed from our understanding of what we call reality. Yes, I've already written that in the D Digital Demon. I stated that if they're interdimensional or from like sliding doors or, you know, another mm. parallel universe, we as a species, we're used to the fact that we're floating in a cosmos that we can barely understand, but we're in it. You know, we're based on planets. Everything uh, will form in that shape you know when people say the earth is flat i mean that's ridiculous when you look at the sun and you look at the planets around it that's an atom and we're based on the atom so it would make sense that the universe or the cosmos would uh, take on some kind of shape be modeled after the atom we are all made of atoms well where these aliens or we call them aliens these travelers come from their world might be completely different they may not have planets or a cosmos like us, they may be based on something entirely different, something we couldn't comprehend. I think it's interesting, when we go down the rabbit hole, we look into these possibilities, which you have to. I can't stand people when they've all got it figured out. They've got it all figured out. They know the race, their names, their ranks, the, 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 the models of their ships. Come on. Yeah, I you mean, know? Come there, on. there is the, the, the thought and the general hypothesis that with regards to the greys themselves, um, they're not very honest with the people that they abduct. Now, I'm not going to get into the argument of the love and light aspect and also, you know, the negative aspect. I can only deal with per personal experience that I had back in the winter of 1989 where I had what they call an abduction. But one of the things I wanted to draw uh, to people's attention is the fact that, you know, people were, I was the, of the understanding of people believe that an abduction happens in a physical level of reality. Well, my experience was anything but. There was one part that was physical and there was another part that was non-physical. And this led me into researching the abduction phenomena on what the greys could possibly represent on another level of reality and, and why they, they keep their, their operation secret. Mm. I mean, I, I've, I've only seen them once and they weren't the greys. This was uh, in uh, 1982. That's Ronnie. The chapter here, we are not going to harm you. Um, and uh, they were not the greys, but as a kid of 13, they, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, you must understand, you're thrown into the situation. They, to me, I referred to them as the doctors, but they were armoured, they were completely covered from head to toe, in kind of like a, a very modern radioactive outfit, armoured. And um, they gave the impression of authority, and they, the one that spoke, who was in charge behind me they used the queen's english so it's only later on in life you think well something's wrong there i mean this did happen it wasn't uh sleep paralysis it wasn't um it wasn't a nightmare this was physical this is what this is what opened my eyes up to the 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 paradox as a whole but when you get older you you tend to think well hang on a minute there's something wrong with that speaking the queen's english the, you know the p's and q's and being doctors, it's only later a friend of ours, Neil Gillis Ward, he informed me of a gentleman who actually looked into um, many cases similar to this. And I'm pleased to say that uh, what he came up with is that the greys, if that's what they are, I mean, I won't know in, until I go under, um, professionally regressed. They're very good at using doctors and cartoons as a guise to conceal their true identity. The chief doctor, the one that spoke the Queen's English, he told me that an operation needs to be done. And he was absolutely adamant this was to be um, instigated. And I, I did cry and, and protest, but of course I was in their power. I was powerless. I was paralyzed to a degree. Um, but I mean, it's all in the book. 
But it's interesting, isn't it, how they use your mind. They somehow used my mind, especially with the Cheshire Cat afterwards, which they projected on the ceiling of the wall when they dropped me back down to my room. That was a godforsaken nightmare. So uh, it took me 30 years to work out what he was, because if I went to see a psychologist or someone and tell them, oh, hang on a minute, he'll say, wait there. You're getting confused. This is Alice in Wonderland. You really have been down the rabbit hole. So that was the nasty aspect of it, because they had covered all their traits. That They covered all the operation and made it look like a fantasy when it was anything but. Yes, and this is why, um, you know, we complain and say that they're being deceptive to us. But if we look at us as a human species, and we have to be very honest here, we're not a nice species. I mean, you know, we're warmongering. Um, we don't know how to treat another person that we don't know. And this is the truth. And I, and I feel also that, you know, that the way we're going is, is we're going to end up like the greys. I mean, they, they appear to have no identity. They seem to uh, work as a one hive mind consciousness. And, you know, as a species now, people, uh, you know, are offensive to someone else if they have an opinion and not allowed an opinion. Um, it's almost as if we are turning or being turned into some kind of AI connection to a big hub. And I don't like the way things are going. And I think eventually in the future, if we start cloning people, I mean, you know, this is this has been my work and my theories with regards to the dangers, the inherent dangers of cloning actual human beings. I'm, I'm not talking about the future with body parts and organs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking, you know, about replicating a fully functional human being because it also brings into question the spiritual ramifications and something this system that we serve does not want to acknowledge. Yes. Do you know, that always bothered me. When I looked into this UFO um, paradox, you know, I read in the 50s and that that the abductees were warned by the aliens then. I think they were the Nordics mostly, because they seem to change faces quite swiftly, don't they? Or whatever's in vogue. The greys now are in vogue, whatever they are. But they, they kept harping on about the concerns then of atomic warfare, of how if we instigated this, it could uh, rip the very fabric of time and space to pieces or or it, it would not be beneficial to them well my argument was this i mean if they're warning the people surely with their technological clout they could easily swiftly knock them out all do it overnight right so they knock them out we build more they do it again we get a slap on the hand we we don't know what's doing this we we can't build them they don't work they've won they haven't now what really grinds my gears is when people say they've already done it they haven't yes some silos might have been switched off temporarily but not permanently so why would they temporarily switch them off if they're so concerned instead of completely nullifying them or just switching them off permanently you know, it, it, it is. It, you've got to think about this. It's true. It's absolutely true. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So to me, that's a kind of deception. So what exactly are we dealing with? Are we dealing with something that's playing with us? We have accounts of people stating that they're here to teach us uh, things that, you know, they're here to advance us. They're not. They certainly are not. In my opinion, this is my opinion, they're not here to teach us. They're deceptive. They hide. And as Philip Mantle rightly uh, stated, people are taken without consent and then they tell you they have the right to. Well, what would tell you that? You know, it's a power above us. Um, something that you can't fight with or argue with. And then we move on to the cattle mutilations and some human mutilations, which is a very uncomfortable subject which people don't like discussing, or certainly those in authority, which Philip and I know about anyway. You know, you have all these. So when people are stating firstly when they've been abducted, they're horrified, and then they state afterwards that, oh, they're teaching us, you know, that they're, they're, they're going to pro progress our ways. I don't believe it. I don't believe that. Until we know what we're dealing with, I, I can just stick that in the bin. What, what are your thoughts on that, Philip? Well, you know, that, the whole thing is so complex, and I think that the system we serve um, needs a conspiracy in order to conceal its own. And this is very much evident with regards to the revelation or lack of uh, information, as it were, with regards to the reality of UAPs. And this is puzzling because, you know, I think now people will be able to accept this. Um, you know, I know back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s, going up to the 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, we haven't progressed any further into what we're really dealing with. So the argument is, you know, are, is there a structured system, a hidden system, 
with faceless, nameless bureaucrats who know more about this? I don't think so. And I believe that, you know, to some level, that's why uh, with the, uh, the advancement of technology and information, Internet, um, Facebook and all those other uh, media outlets, um, that a lot of these people that remain hidden and in, or in positions of authority are watching researchers and seeing what they're coming out with. Um, and, and still, we, we're no nearer to truly comprehending or understanding what we're dealing with. So, you know, th this is the problem, I think, um, that we have. But I think it's important that you stick with what you're working on, you know, whatever you're, you're researching or wherever your, your investigations take you, is to, to remain vigilant and to believe in your truths, because there's a lot of people out there who are convinced it's this or it's that. But as stated, as Ronnie stated earlier, we are open to all forms of speculation. We cannot, you know, say that this is what it is or that's what it is because we just don't know. And I think that's very important by having an open mind and, you know, taking into consideration all of the many cases, UFO sightings across the world. You know, it's important to record and, and log them and also to listen to what people have to say. And yes, there are people, unfortunately, who muddy the waters with disinformation or lies or whatever. But, you know, as, as serious researchers, I think you can see beyond that point, that level. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually even speculated whether, in the book I published it, whether they're the dead. You know, they look embryonic. You know, they look half dead themselves. You know, could they be, this be something to do with the dead, the deceased? Perhaps uh, souls that have uh, fallen and are offered some kind of redemption. I know it sounds ridiculous. I know it sounds religious, you know, and I'm not, I'm not religious myself. But you have to consider all aspects, time travellers, interdimensional, um, outer worlds, uh, the ocean, Antarctica, underground, um, you know, so why not also the dead? Mm. You know, I mean, you, we don't know. I mean, the, the whole thing that throws us is we see them as a technological clout, a power, because of these ships that accompany them. But could this be an illusion? Yeah, I, I could, could this be a complete fallacy? I think, to be honest with you, that, you know, we're only beginning to understand about human consciousness and about the way that our brains work. Um, and they say we only use about 10, maybe 15 percent of it. But I've always argued that there's more to us as a species with regards to consciousness. And there's every, you know, I, I had an article published back in 1996 in the Alien Encounters magazine, and it was called Spirits in a Material World. And even all those years ago, I argued um, about the similarities between an abduction and a near-death experience. And that they, this, this obviously opens up parallels to different dimensions of awareness or realities. And I've always believed that when we die, you know, take away the religious ideologies, we are a biological vehicle in this life recording all of the experiences that we're going through. And perhaps when we finish this incarnation, that those memories that we've amassed is sent back into the hub or the Godhead to expand upon the, the creation process. And I think as individuals, each and every one of us are droplets of this consciousness or this, this, this hub or Godhead and trying to find out more about itself through the extension of us. And, you know, this is why I think it's important to, uh, you know, to cover cloning because we are born into the world, you know, through re reproduction. It's an amazing system. And I believe that through that process of reproduction, through the birthing cycle, we carry memories, not just from the past, but also that it could be possible for the future. But if we clone something, it'll be like a blank canvas. It'll only have the memory of one incarnation. And maybe the greys seem to be uh, beings that are trying to rise from the ashes of their past and reclaim their right as uh, sentient beings, spiritual beings. We just don't know. Well, the thing is, someone asked a very interesting question about Philip and myself, because we are identical twins. Uh, we were born seven minutes apart. Now, what's interesting is when I saw the doctors in 1982, or the alleged doctors, and Philip had his in 1989, your encounter, mm -hmm. that's seven years apart. So is there some relevance here? Now, someone asked a very interesting question. They said, do you think they were interested in you because you're twins? Well, I immediately said no, because... 
twins ostensibly speaking are uh, clones so Ooh, if wow. they're masters of cloning these things why on earth would they need to look at twins when they they're quite capable of doing it themselves mm. you know but let's have some fun come on let's tell our listeners about you know we've got to have some fun in this as well because we not only do we impersonate people like miss butcher you know like that philip and i we used to write to a lot of authors in the past before we were published ourselves and one particular man was absolutely lovely um uh, we 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 wrote to him his name was john christopher yes the author of the tripod that's right he wrote a series of books called the white mountains the city of golden lead and, and the pool, pool of, of fire. fire that's right and and what we did we don't know why we did this but because philip and i are good at art you're good too philip you say no but what we used to do is we used to make each other laugh so we characterized john christopher we found a picture this is this is pre-internet this is before we had all digital. We, we went to a library and this lovely old librarian, we said, do you have a picture of John Christopher? And she said, well, let me have a look. So a few days later, we went back. She said, hey, I found you a picture of John Christopher. And oh, my God, it, I'll tell you what, he, he's a lovely looking man. He, he's like your granddad. He's got his glasses on and that. So what Philip and I did, being cheeky so-and-sos, we started doing comic strips involving John Christopher and his aliens. So... In his books, The Aliens Invade Earth, they're like the tripods. They've got these horrible critters the in there. Masters. The masters controlling them. And they cat people. So basically that just subdues them so they don't uh, have any uh, pretty ideas about waging war against them. So what Philip and I did, we used to do each other. We'd take some paper and we'd do a comic strip and we wouldn't show each other until we'd finish them to make each other laugh. And you did it of John Christopher with his head drilled open, with yeah. a cat being oh, stuck in. Yeah, do you but, remember? But he was very sweet. And he oh, he was, And he yeah. wrote us three letters. And also, we have to uh, thank a very good dear friend of ours, David Sapstein, who is the author of Cocoon. And they made one of his books into a, a, a Hollywood movie. And he's a cocoon, one, yeah, yes. cocoon, and that's a beautiful film. Yeah, um, aliens with a different twist. Obviously, they were very caring, loving ali aliens, and it's all about the fountain of youth, and about these old folks uh, retired, and that they found this pool and this pool of water where the aliens were retrieving their cocoons from the ocean. They're coming back for their people that uh, that when they were based in Atlantis, it sank, and they're coming back. And, of course, the liquid they use in the pool gives some kind of rejuvenation. And I think, to be honest with you, I mean, Ronnie, Ronnie heard from David. He always hears from David. He's, uh, he's from, a lovely man. From yeah, America. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think it's wonderful to, because David Sapperstein also believes in life on other planets and well, yes. UFOs. And, yeah. you know, and, and it's really interesting to know that to, to, to see people and to connect with them and to see what their ideas are, are all about yeah he's been lovely David has been our mentor we've been in touch with him since the mid 80s and yes, so that's right, he's yeah. encouraged Philip and I because of course the Cocoon film is based on his best selling books and that you know so there, there was Cocoon Metamorphosis and Butterfly the, in the book series I didn't rate Cocoon too much I mean I didn't like that but the original movie was his so that was fantastic and they used a flying saucer I said to David, my God, they used a flying saucer. This was not the flying saucer in the book. It was a different ship. I'm not going to give that away because no. you need to read those books. But he said, yeah, you know, they were in they were in style. The saucer was the thing. Well, I thought, yes, because you've got your Kenneth Johnson's V yeah, and yeah. you've got the cocoon, the flying saucer. There's just something nice about them. They look so neat, don't yeah. they? They just look so trippy. And David, <laughs> David Sapperstein always jokes and says that our mother has got the first class ticket on the Ontarian mothership. Oh, yeah, she's got a first so class the, ticket. The, the world of eternal youth. Yeah. <laughs> it is wonderful. We, isn't we it? don't need it yet. No, no not yet. No, I don't not think yet. Need. But I, I think you know, and also the other the other people that have been very instrumental in our life. There's too numerous to mention. Um, but you know, Philip Mantle as well. Yes. Who, um, and this is this will make you all laugh, as you know, Philip Mantle is the British ufologist, and uh, you know, a, an amazing guy. And many years ago Ronnie was looking at one of his books that he published through his Flying Disc Press I didn't know Philip at the he time didn't know I him. didn't know who he was and, and Ronnie sent Philip an email saying you know I think your books are too expensive you need to and bring them down the prices anyway, down anyway I said to Ronnie who are you who are you talking to and Ronnie said someone called Philip Mantle and I said <laughs> oh my god I knew who Philip Mantle was and I said did you not know that he's the top ufologist in England well then of course we laughed and of course it led then led us on to connect with Philip yeah. who's been 
Well, what I didn't realise, the book he had published was full colour. So, of course, it's a little bit more pricey than others, which they usually are. Mm. So I was a bit ignorant of that. But it's funny how friendships are formed, yeah. because after that, we befriended each other. And then we're the best of best yeah. of colleagues, aren't uh, we? I think it's wonderful also in the UFO community with, you know, your Paul Sinclair's and Dr. Owen Scott from the United States, Kathleen Martin, Peter Robbins, and the list goes on, old Gray Anderson, on all these wonderful souls that are all looking for the same thing. And I think it's so wonderful that we have a, you know, the kind of like the same mindset mm -hmm. and the same interests. And this is what draws people together. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. Yes, we haven't done any cartoons of Philip Mantle or Paul no, Sinclair no, no. or Dr. Irina Scott. No, no, we haven't done that. But John Christopher, he was like, it was a time, wasn't it, when we were doing these cartoons. Yeah, we never showed in them because, my God, he wouldn't appreciate them, would he? No, and that was the time <laughs> when they released the series on TV, the Tripods. Yes. And they only did series one and series two, but I remembered it was the second series when we were amazed at the BBC and we'd had letters from the producers Richard Bates, Richard Bates he was nice, about the model that they'd used of the, the inside of the Master City which was quite impressive back then it was an entire model um, and that's when John Christopher w had written to me and my brother and, you know, uh, hoping you're enjoying the series and all the rest of it. I mean, he's sadly passed over now um, quite a while ago. But, uh, you know, w when you connect with these people, for us, it was very inspirational. I think that's important that you have people, even we look up to people and we did then and we still do now, like your heroes and heroines. Yes. You have you, to have them. You know what's amazing with John Christopher? I'd never, we didn't have internet then. I mean, we had a picture of him like your, your grandfather you know but we never heard him speak well recently we saw an interview with him a brief interview and when he spoke I was like oh my god is that is that that's the, you know you you have this impression don't you that they sound differently I don't know what in my mind he was but it was anything but that because he, he said well, they couldn't afford a life-size tripod. I thought, my God, is that how he sounds? <laughs> oh my God! I, do you just get this? Do you just get this thing in your head, don't you? That when you when you idolise someone and you you've never seen them really, and then you hear them speak and think, oh my God, is that him? Is that him? Mm. It sounded so different to how I imagined. It sounded very posh, didn't it? Mm. And all those years ago, we were connected um, to the Whitley Strebers. Um, network with people that would like to communion network, communion wasn't network it? yes and we had some letters from some amazing people yes and unfortunately we had some oh from god the, the, we the, had some crazies in yeah. there yes yeah, so, <laughs> i know bless their hearts i mean this was years ago this was in what was it the early the 90s late, no the early, the early 90s, 90s yeah, wasn't it we'll oh 80s. my god one woman uh, you i mean my goodness we had letter after letter after letter about how she's obsessed with bold men I mean, she's seen the aliens and she wants bold ba alien babies. And I thought, my God, this is getting ridiculous. So, I mean, bless her heart, she's obviously got, you know, there's something, obsession there which she has to deal with. But good Lord, you don't offer, I'm going to say it, you get your fruitcakes in there, don't you? You do. Yeah, I remember I mean, come on, something on TV, and this is another thing about ufology that we have to address here because the media machine, what it does is it, it will promote anything that's ridiculous. And there was one video I was watching, that's when we had videos, and uh, it was obviously on TV before it's put onto tape. And there was one lady um, who said that she'd been taken to the moon oh, and God. she'd gone onto the moon with the greys and minus, uh, you know, helmet, and they were dancing and laughing and have a great time. And I realized at that point unfortunately within ufo research where the media is concerned you know they will do everything that they can within their power to you know make it all seem ridiculous oh they love that didn't they and they they'll promote that. That. oh yes yeah. but you know when you want to tell the truth which we've all been truth and you want to get the real message across you find you're deleted or they edit it i mean you know television isn't everything um, no but it does it does let's be honest it's like films they hype it up yeah. they make it dramatic you see with me and the doctors that wasn't very interesting it wouldn't be in a film mm. because they were just they were performing this apparent or alleged procedure and that was it mm. but when if they put it in a film form they glorify it to make it gory or horrific you know that's how they work you see this mm. this media but you're right anything that sounds completely outlandish and ridiculous they'll that broadcast heavily of course they will because they're making a mockery of it they want to say to people look at that that's ridiculous you know look at her dancing on the moon kicking up lunar dust mm. with the greys all round her my goodness. And you can see this programming or conscious programming 
on a daily level, um, you only have to go on some of the, well, um, not some, nearly all of them, on the social media sites about news. And you see the fear mongering and the, you know, the, the scare tactics that are used all the time. And I, I'm, I, I don't let it affect me or when it doesn't let it affect him, but it's almost like a drip, drip feed. And I'm, I'm wondering to myself, well, I've never felt like I belonged on this planet. I think Ronnie and I have come to the wrong planet. And that, you know, I think a lot of us might have done. I think so. And, I, and looking at this, I'm thinking, how backwards is this? You know, where is our progression? You know, we, we don't seem to be progressing. Everything seems to be all about money and this this bottomless pit. Yes. And, and you know, and it's all control and like, you know, disabling that, that you know, your power as an individual. But I, I just want to state to all of you out there to let you know that no one has exclusive rights over you. You came onto this earth as you are. You are, you, you know, your thoughts and your beliefs are sacred to you. And that, you know, I'm sure that you probably feel like, hey, get me off this planet. Uh, because it, it, when you look at it, it's complete madness. And all we've ever wanted is the truth. But once again, the system in many ways, not just with ufology or cryptozoology or the paranormal, they will continue to deny. But did you notice also, ladies and gentlemen, that when this report was, was forthcoming about the UFOs, and all of a sudden, and I've got to say it, there were celebrities coming out of the woodwork, obviously to bump up their profiles, saying that they're interested in UFOs, that they become like the official narrative. Mm -hmm. The real, few of them, yeah, the real people are you researchers out there. You're the ones that hold the torch mm -hmm. and have the knowledge of what you think and feel is going on. So I just want you to understand that no matter what we're going through or what happens in this crazy world, that you focus upon your beliefs, you focus upon yourself and know how brilliant that you are, that no one can bring you down. No one. No, 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 Philip. You, you got me all wrong. You got me all wrong. You got lovely eyes. You got me all wrong. Now, oh, take I know a who, moment I know who that to was. catch your yeah, breath. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. Philip and I have this joke. We, As I said, we impersonate people. There was one particular... Um, a gentleman on TV um, uh, in the religious sector, that's all I'll say, um, that uh, is um, um, quest um, questionable. Now, you, you got, now you've got me all wrong. You got, you got lovely eyes. Oh God, so corny, <laughs> wasn't it? Ah, but we oh. love taking people off, just like John Christopher. Now we, just, you know, you know, they they couldn't yeah. afford to build a life-sized tripod. But the thing is, though, that I think that with anyone, you know, in in the the world of the media circuit, you know, you've got to be seen as like, you know very professional but we are human and we do have a sense of humor and i think that gets you through a lot of the crazy chaos that occurs around the world and you know there are some people that need some tlc uh, a little bit of um, you know attention and to try and help them through these difficult times but I, I, with regards to the ufo subject um you know people are talking about disclosure well we haven't seen anything yet have we and I, and we we've not argued in a negative way but we've kind of like debated you know how this is going to happen and i think the only way it's going to happen is through each individual you know take you know take take for instance v kenneth johnson's amazing he was hour. brilliant with that he was and he wrote to he? you and he allowed you to use this i wrote to yeah, i wrote to your kenneth johnson and he was an absolute sweetheart do you know i i needed to use i wanted to use a piece of material for my book um based on his brilliant v and you know the kind guy he wrote back and he said sure fine you know go ahead with it you're okay with that and i was really really blessed because his his story basically it becomes a fascist state doesn't it the aliens turned the humans against each other which was a damn clever thing to do yeah. but he was a clever man very clever and he's not just done these done the incredible hulk mm. the barnick woman he's done no end of programs but his concept was that these big U motherships these ufos would come over the planet yes. and then everyone would see them i would believe you me i would love that to happen that yeah. would be a monumental day and i always joke and say that ufologists won't be out of a job because there'll be more to discover and learn by via our visitors yes but philip this is sir patrick moore here <laughs> there's no evidence of that what's clever uh, yes yeah, if you took him away privately <laughs> he'd probably agree but it's the media machine i think hands are tied. yeah i think with the v i think with the v they were we would all be overwhelmed by the power Mm. And the, the, the absolute technological clout these things have, the course, should be bowled over. The good thing is, I mean, they were sucked in. 
Mm. Kenneth Johnson gave this this incredible uh, vision of people being sucked into the superpower that arrived that were so lovely and they smiled and they shook hands and and yet they, they, and that's what Juliet Juliet Paris says doesn't she Paris says in it yeah. you know the nasty thing is they're so, so damn nice about it yeah and that's quite frightening I think that was very clever what he did mm. you know but I think that disclosure will probably have to come about through us how that's going to happen we don't know but remember I mentioned about the spiritual component that spark of awareness that uniqueness that's you and I believe that you know people are already beginning to change in this world the old system is beginning to slowly crumble and collapse and you know this whole vision about it's all about money and power and control I think people are getting tired of that now because this wheel is forever going round and people are stopping and saying hang on a minute there must be more to this there has to be more to what I am and where I figure in all of this and I think that is a wonderful thing so I've just got to send out a little message of hope to all of you uh, girls and guys out there if you're wondering the same thing it's it's uh, something that's very important to acknowledge now Philip is Sir Patrick Morgan do you believe we'll have an alien visitation so <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't believe that at the moment. I would love to believe that. You know, you open up the curtains one morning and then you see them in the sky. That would be absolutely amazing. The big question is: Are they going to be positive or are they going to be negative? We're not going to know their intentions. Or are they going to be wearing crocodile grins? They're yeah. going to be smiling and shaking hands. But saying that, you know, would an alien species come here? And again, we go back to that question look at what we represent look how we treat this planet look how we treat one another it's not a nice picture and i think and feel that until we come to that realization until we come to the understanding that we have to take care of this planet and i'm not one of these you know people that sit in the middle of a field meditating all day i'm being practical here our world gaia is a living system it exists it's given us everything that we have around us uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been created via the mind. The, this planet has given us the resources. And until we throw away our matches, you know, I don't think we're going to make any headway uh, anytime soon. But I think it's important that on an individual level, we're aware there's a greater intelligence, not just to ourselves, but out there in the universe, whether it be interdimensionally, physically, or ultra-terrestrial, whatever way you want to see it. Um, by being yourself and sending out good thoughts and trying to deal with all of the negative in a positive light, I think that's 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 as good as we can get at the moment. <laughs> You've got me all wrong, Philip. You've got me all wrong. You've got lovely eyes. So I mentioned all of this in uh, my book, You the yes. Public Deceive, the Grandeur for Deception. And, and the, I, I, you know, I have to boast a little bit here and tell you that I was very honoured with a lot of other um, top ufologists, researchers around the world. Um, Earl Grey Anderson was one of them, Kathleen Marden, many, many others. Paul Sinclair wrote the foreword to that book, and he's a brilliant guy doing some brilliant research. And I think it's important because I'm, my work now is uh, stretching out to more models uh, in terms of thought about the Greys that I'm not going to mention here. Um, that's a, a whole new project I've started working on, along with another book. And um, all will be revealed much later next year. Hopefully that 2022 won't be as difficult or as as harsh as the, the one that we've just experienced. But I, I have to tell you that it is exciting to research. And we do get tired. We get disillusioned. I think that's part of the human process. But I think also to be inspired is the main thing. When you're inspired by watching films, listening to music, or, you know, just whatever whatever floats your boat. I think that's important to remain positive and focused um, because there's a lot of disillusioned people out there and the world's in a very bad place. But I do believe that we're going through some kind of shift and maybe things happen for particular reasons. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I also want to say thank you to Mark and Irina and um, Irene, uh, Neil, Neil Geddes Ward, Philip Mantle, uh, Earl Gray Anderson, who he also features in my book, his his case was quite disturbing, and that is with the Greys. Um, I looked into that, so I want to thank them all very much. Paul Sinclair, who's been absolutely lovely to Philip and myself, he's a brilliant researcher. You know, you, it, the list goes on and on. The one thing about this is you come across uh, a lot of wonderful people, don't they you? They are. They're you wonderful. come across a, a lot of people who have very interesting insights into it, and I love that, you know. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You've got all these pieces everywhere, and you're trying to put them together. 
and we were talking to Dr. Irina Scott uh, not long ago. Yes. And we were discussing about the universe and about yes. well, she's a scientist her, and her, light and her, her views were very interesting, yeah. especially about the cosmos. You know, I mean, I, I said to her, "What what are we in? You know, what do you think it is? I mean, are we in a bubble? Mm. Is it endless? What is it? You know, I mean, we're all we're all hankering for some kind of answer, but do you know what? I don't think we're going to get it any time soon, and, and it's not our fault. We're still progressing. We're still learning. Yeah. You know, we we creatures of curiosity. That's our inherent right to seek answers. But uh, Patrick Moore did state that you know, the deeper you get, the more complicated it, it, becomes, it becomes. Doesn't it? Yes, and also with regards to you know, thinking about our solar system and it's a tiny speck in this mass of infiniteness and, and what's interesting is that let's just hypothesize here for a moment I and mean, if we could travel beyond what we think is the speed of light you know and we, we went to the edge of the universe would we come into another universe um, or would there be another universe within that universe or would there be an edge an, an edge to it we don't know do no. we do we come back on upon ourselves and that question alone is absolutely awe-inspiring because as a kid I used to you know think what it would be like if I jumped off the top of the earth and did I if I fell would I keep going down obviously you'll float <laughs> but you know if I kept going down would I then reappear at some point back where I started or would I just keep going on forever and of course that concept frightened the hell out of me as a kid because I thought this is too much it's, it's too vast your, your brain cannot um, you know, register all of that. But there again, I believe that our human brain is, is limited within its processing of information to a degree, unless we bring the mind faculty into this. And I think that most of these beings do use their minds a lot more than what we use ours. And as I said before, we create via the mind physically, they may create and can create anything through the mind instantaneously. Well, yes, but the thing is, they know us very well, don't they? They evidently do, because the doctors even knew my name, and I didn't know who they were. They yes. knew us very well. Yes. So, And to draw up the Cheshire Cat at the end to project it as a hologram, a very clever looking thing yeah you know uh, which it took me a long time to realize it was some kind of advanced hologram mm. using our fairy tales mm, yes. i mean what does that say about them they it's as if they can go in your mind or pluck things out or they are well aware of our own personal tastes now that is worrying because they know us very well don't they yeah and it could be that we're dealing with an ancient force that's been here for a very long time and much longer than we've been yes. here yes i mean as i said if you take into uh, consideration our creation the mythos and also the kind of like not mythos the facts that most people prefer and I've always believed that we were genetically modified by an extraterrestrial species not necessarily the greys but a lot of brilliant researchers in the past um, you know Eric von Duniken and you know also yes. Zesha Zicherai if I pronounced his name right I can never pronounce, I his, can't name. pronounce his name um, but these these scholars are absolutely incredible and you know look how they were treated within the uh, scientific community and you know subjugated at the time, at the time it's now changed. but see how we've evolved through time that there is beginning to be cut there's beginning to be a gradual acceptance within the human psyche and because we've been programmed since an early age to believe that this is real and that's not and this is right and that's wrong which I believe that those values are important but when it gets to mental manipulation on a deceptive level that changes everything but I think now most of the world is beginning to open up to the fact that yes UFOs do exist that is without question that the question that we are now asking is where are they what are they where do they come from but that throws into question reality exactly is this the real McCoy or a hologram or a hologram we don't know I mean you'd laugh at it because you think no it can't be a hologram why you know, not you, it's everything solid but as we stated as we know we're taught everything is made up of atoms so you know uh, uh, is there is there something that can infiltrate or manipulate these atoms something so advanced it can uh, shape around them are the greys as i said myself i actually mentioned this in vogue at the moment and what will come after them will they reshape themselves i mean we have no end of different kinds of forms of aliens reported from the mantids to the nordics to the greys to the demons yes because there's been varied models of man throughout the you know the ages mm. and where there's been some kind of remodification that's occurred on a genetic level and i also believe that you know 
it's really amazing to think that you know we're all looking for these answers and that's the really exciting part about it isn't it is looking at yes. it but i think that you know if we don't change as a human species as ronnie has quite rightfully said we are going to be thrown into an ai universe um literally where no one will have be able to think for themselves or be creative they'll have no identity now that is frightening and i think that i wouldn't want to be a part of that world and i think that if this has happened to another species that they want to reclaim themselves through their own mistakes we don't know but it's a it's a possibility that we have to look into and it's very interesting uh, to say the least yeah well ai yes i mean we need technology i've always stated this but why is it that every time we progress up the ladder is abused. Mm. The internet, who would have thought of that? You and I would never have dreamed of the internet when we were kids if no. it didn't exist. Um, Record but, players, tape decks. Yeah, <laughs> but the trouble is with that is with the internet, it's abused. Mm. It's used as a propaganda machine, a fascist state where the news media will broadcast what they want you to see. That's right. Um, it's rather like the firewalls. You now have to pay for security because you can be infiltrated why is it everything is always abuse and you mark my words they will develop robots butlers in the future but even they will be abused someone will try and hack into them to open up the door and let thieves in or even worse and god forbid kill their masters under the influence of someone else well, you don't know do you it's uh, quite horrifying the, the future is beautiful but it's also ugly I think. yeah so well on that note we're coming to the end of the show and um we've had we just thought we'd uh, tell you a little bit about what's been going on and with, of ourselves and of ourselves yeah. ronnie as well and yeah. also to send that message of goodwill to all of you out there and let's hope that we get further developments within the ufo phenomena and uh, you know because we are all important instruments to the unfolding of this reality and even if it's a holographic projection it's every possibility to believe that we're programmed within this reality to see what we see because we can only detect a certain amount of the ultraviolet uh, uh, radiation levels be truthful to yourself and really look after yes, yourself. Yes, it's okay. You know, I said that, and it's true for us, we're left with a blank page again, but that's okay, you know. It's a fresh, nice, clean page. You just go back to the drawing board. We don't have the answers. We don't. But the good thing is, is to speculate. That's the most healthiest thing of all, because you can look at everything and try and form some kind of conclusion. You've been listening to Twin Souls in association with the Paranormal UK radio network. Stay safe and watch the skies.